everyone, and welcome to our Center of Nursing Inquiry Education Workshop on Inquiry Dissemination. I'm Holly Farley. I'm here with Maddie, and we have two participants, Ashley and Raven. Hello. So today we're going to be distinguishing between the various types of dissemination formats, whether it's poster, podium, presentation, or publication in a manuscript define various abstract types and the components of each of those, articulate poster templates and guidelines for each form of inquiry project, which could be ABP, QI research, and describe different nursing journals, how to determine the audience for those, how to prepare manuscripts and adhere to guidelines and inquiry templates. All right, so like I mentioned before, we are sort of gonna talk about the different, the life cycle of a pro of project. Um, especially once we get to the dissemination route. Um, the project in my mind almost, ne it never really ends. You're sort of constantly morphing the content and expanding your audience. So this is sort of what we're gonna be talking about through the course of the next hour or two. So traditionally um, for a project, people would maybe do a poster presentation that might become a podium presentation and that's later turned into a manuscript. That's just sort of the typical life, life cycle but there's, that's not written in stone by any means. So you can do a poster to a manuscript and skip the podium, or you can do a manuscript to a podium and skip the poster. Um, I've also done a manuscript and gone back to a poster. So there's no right way to do it, but in terms of the amount of work and sort of getting your feet wet with it, it's um, a little bit easier sometimes to go from poster to podium to manuscript. But just so you know, there's no one way. Um, but whether you're doing a manuscript or a poster, they do both have um, one thing in common, two things in common. The first is that they all have an abstract. So I think that um, from the conversations we've had, we're all pretty familiar with um, the abstracts that it's actually your submission for your poster. Um, but a manuscript is also going to have an abstract in the beginning that's sort of describing the content of the paper. And then at Hopkins, they actually all, the other thing they have in common is they all need your director's approval um, or their designee. So like in the emergency departments, usually the assistant director who looks at them. And that's all part of, there's actually a um, Johns Hopkins nursing policy related to publication. The idea is basically like, we're not putting something out there that has really low quality or maybe need, is um, not promoting Johns Hopkins nursing in the way that we would want it to be. So it's not, it's usually a, pretty um, simple step. You just submit it to your director. They read through it. Sometimes they can actually give you some really good edits. And then, um, then you're all set to submit to either your conference or your journal. But this is a big step that sometimes people will forget. All right, so what is an abstract? Anyways, so an abstract is a condensed version of your work that's basically a teaser. So it gives enough information that someone can look at it and decide if they wanna know more. Um, it's, I think we've also all looked at them um, in the beginning of a paper. It's, do you wanna keep reading that paper or what, do you just want some high level information about what they found? So really it's enough to give a little bit of a window into what's, what your full project is. So there are different types. There's conference abstracts, which, tend to look like this. Here, um, the first two are Word documents that we're calling for um, abstracts. And then the third one is a um, online submission form. For Nursing Scholars Day at Hopkins, we've used a Paltrick survey, but um, have you guys seen something more similar to this last ENA um, screenshot here where you're submitting through an online portal for the conference? Have you guys seen that before? No. Um, it actually can get pretty technical. So if you look, um, I actually, this is when I actually submitted, I think. It says um, tests completed in the middle and then you can see all these different things. So really it's like taking you through um, every single step about what, and instead of submitting it all via Word document, you're submitting it all online through their online portal. But that can include things like they actually wanted you to upload a photo, you have to give a biography, um, they want your objectives, things like that, and it's also where you would upload a lot of your other author's information. So they can go anywhere from just submitting a Word doc in a very generic way to an email address to like a specific person to these really large online portals. Um, I think, Holly, have you submitted to Magnet? No. Whew. No, okay. 
I haven't either, but they, I'm fairly okay. certain use something similar to this. Those big conferences, they really need to have an online version so that they can um, pull all their, all the submissions together. Yeah, I love that. And I love a good checklist, so. <laughs> um, well, and we'll get a little more into how this can be helpful, but then some of the getting other authors and things like that, to, they're going to have to log in as well. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then, so those are the conference abstracts. And then these are our manuscript abstracts, which is sort of what we already mentioned. Um, these are just some examples of, again, a teaser into what the high level information is. And if sometimes if you just want to see what the answer is, so, you know, it's a paper about does XYZ work, so you can read in the results and conclusion, did it work? So it's a little bit of a cheat sheet. There are also video abstracts, which I'm going to try and play one here. Tell me if you can hear the sound. I don't hear anything and it looks paused. Is it working? Yeah, it's, not, it's thinking. Okay. While that's loading, um, I first heard of the video abstracts from this journal, and I was so <laughs> I've never seen that before. But um, this was even like before COVID time, so I feel like now would be a good time to just like go watch a video abstract. But I I wonder who thought of this as a way to market your uh, your paper. And Hi, I am Hannah Johnson, the author of Restorative Nursing Documentation and Quality Improvement, which was recently published in the Journal of Nursing Care Quality. I'd like to talk to you about this pilot study that I did concerning quality improvement in a nursing assistant documentation. Last year, I used the framework of Six Sigma for process improvement and error reduction related to the documentation and auditing process of a nursing home's restorative programming. This was mainly for proof of concept because Six Sigma has not really been used before by itself in nursing home settings. More often, lean is used to reduce waste and medical error in order to work toward the goals of the quadruple aim in healthcare. That's very up Holly's alley in her lean Sigma. Um, so that's like a very basic one where she's really just like looking at the camera. This is a little bit more fancy. Sorry, I don't know why it's taking so long to open. There we go. Hello, my name is Heather Gilmartin. I am an investigator and nurse scientist at the Denver Seattle Center of Innovation, which is a research center within the Veterans Health Administration. My colleagues and I recently completed a VA study that investigated the relationship between psychological safety and reported non-adherence to the bedside central line insertion checklist in a national sample of intensive care nurses. In this video, I will cover the highlights of our work. To begin with, what is psychological safety? Psychological safety is the degree to which employees believe they will not get in trouble for making errors, asking for help, or seeking feedback. In our study, this looks like a nurse who stops a bedside central line placement until all members of the surgical team have masks and caps on. This also looks like the nurse completing the documentation on the safety checklist that indicates one aspect was not initially followed. So those are just a couple examples. Have you guys seen those before? This, um, it wasn't until Holly actually mentioned them to me that I even knew that they existed. Yeah, that yeah. was so fancy. You can tell she works in an innovation center. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, it's just a more, it's a kind of a dynamic way to present your information. If, traditionally, you still are submitting that written abstract or a full paper, and then they're contacting you to say, hey, this is, we think that our readers would maybe want to see more about this. Would you be able to record something? Um, so this isn't in place of another, of the abstract or the paper itself, but it can be in addition to. 
Um, and I think like Holly mentioned, because we are in COVID times and the conferences are happening either virtually or being canceled, I wouldn't be surprised if these become a little bit more popular. And it's a nice way to, to sort of get new, to get content without having to just read a journal. Um, mm -hmm. It sort of breaks things up a little bit. Yeah, and they're all like three minutes. So not too, not too long. To yeah, for sure. Um, Holly, were you going to do one? Did it just not? Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, yes. Yeah, so that's how I first heard of it. So um, for that journal of nursing care quality, the editor was like, Oh, Holly, can you do a video abstract of your paper? So it was like after that abstract was accepted, paper written, revisions times three made, and like published. So it was way after the fact, just like a marketing strategy. So I was like, oh, yeah, that's right up my alley. I love like being recorded and stuff. So I had a script all laid out, but I, the, my other um, team members, like, we just never had time to do it. It was kind of right when I transitioned into this role too, so I wasn't working with them every day anymore. And then I just never did it, so. But it's so helpful to know the process, so thank you for sharing. It was helpful to know that it's a thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to call you out, sorry. I know. Um, so, the, so the, all the, again, the abstract idea is the same, but the, there's a one really big difference between the abstract associated with a manuscript and the abstract associated with a conference. Um, and that is when you are writing a manuscript, you typically write the abstract last, but for a poster presentation, you write the abstract first because you're trying to get the reviewers to, to um, want more information from you to participate in the conference. Whereas in the manuscript, you've already shared all of your content and then you need to go back and say, okay, here are the high level points from each of these sections. So how can I convey this information in a really succinct way so that people will want to read the whole paper? Um, I have seen people try and um, they'll do an abstract for a poster or a podium and then they'll decide they want to write a paper and they try and use that abstract for the paper, thinking that it'll maybe save time. And I can tell you, I, it does not save time. It's, um, you end up trying to like finagle all the little pieces. And so it um, ends up being, I think, a lot easier to just sort of set that aside, say that was step one, now we're on step two. And once you've written the paper, you kind of go through again and pull out a couple sentences from each section that really convey the overall message of that section um, versus trying to kind of back it into something that's already been written. Um, so just keep that in mind. I've also seen people go ahead and write the abstract for a paper before they've written the paper. And again, that kind of, it sort of pigeonholes you into an outline that you might not end up um, following. Um, so Ashley and Raven, have you guys attended, how many conferences have you attended? I know you've been at Nursing Scholars Day. I attended the Mercy EBP Symposium last year. Yeah. Um, that was really cool. That was, you know, it was just neat to, you know, I've been Nursing Scholars Day, which is great, but it was neat to go just to a completely different conference. Um, and it was in Maryland, so it wasn't far away. Yeah. Yeah, this is a nice local conference so that, and they do a lot of really cool stuff, but you don't have to go very far. I've only done like Nursing Scholars Day where I've actually like been an attendee. Um, I went um, to, the ATC one year just as a plus one so I kind of snuck into one uh, <laughs> one class um, but other than that I really haven't been to many conferences. What is ATC? It's the transplant conference. Oh cool. So yeah, so there's basically all realms of conferences from the local that are happening at hospitals or um, just in the city, um, really targeted towards a local audience, um, all the way to regional, state, national, and international. Um, so how do you figure out which conferences are even happening? Um, Sigma Theta Tau does have a website that has a um, sort of a compilation of things that are coming up. It's probably a little, looks a little different right now because of COVID and the virtual nature. But this is a website that it kind of, it gives you some sort of big, some of the bigger conferences and when they're happening as well as their website. So let's see here. And it tells you also where they're happening. So if you want to go to like, if you really want to go to Kentucky, the Trans Transcultural Nursing Society is having 
conference there. Um, so this can be a good place to look. The other thing is a lot of times people are either members of the professional organization associated with their specialty or at least sort of follow them um, or subscribe to any of their public like newsletters or emails. And a lot of professional organizations, a big part of what they do is put on conferences. So for example, I'm, um, my background is emergency nursing. So I'm part of the Emergency Nurse Association and they actually just had their conference um, at the beginning of the month, it was all virtual. Uh, but they, because I'm a member of the organization, I get the emails that are saying, hey, we were having a conference come up and they'll also give you a heads up on when the abstracts would be due. I did wanna mention that abstracts can be sometimes asked for almost a year ahead of time. I think that's what Magnet does, it's about a year. So sometimes I think people are a little bit surprised that they need to turn something in so early. I, I've, I've completely missed deadlines because I looked nine months ahead of time instead of a year. And so that lag time, that lead time really depends, but tends to be the bigger the conference, the bigger the lead time. Um, so just keeping that, keep that in mind as you're looking for conferences and trying to plan out when you might be able to attend. And I'm actually just gonna click on one of these to show you what it looks like. Let's see. While she's doing that, I was thinking Raven, ITNS would be a good one for you to submit to as well. International Transplant Nurses Society. Um, they're having their conference in November, so now's a good time to check when they're having abstracts for next year. Yeah, for sure. So here, this is just, um, it looks like this is the continuing nursing education in your University of Washington through the School of Nursing. This is their conference. And so it's talking about the virtual format, the event, the cost, wanted to see if they are asking for abstracts. Actually, let me pick one that's further out because they will be asking. Okay, so this one's creating healthy work environments. It's in February. You can register. It's like they don't have a call for abstracts either yet. Oh, presenters. So these are, so here the people have already, they've already uh, submitted it looks like because they actually are already up to the guidelines of what you should be doing when you submit. But on the website they'll usually, they'll have the, the due date as well as some more information about the conference itself and I'll show you what that looks like in, um, in a couple minutes. Um, so that's, that's a good place to look. STTI is a good repository for conference information. And um, and this is just an example. This was um, AONL. Uh, this is an email that they sent out. It was talking about your professional organizations. This one was sent to um, my coworker Barb in the ED because um, she's part of. It's the they changed from AONE to AONL. The uh, what is it? Um, something nurse leaders. No, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, what is um, that? Organization. Something yeah. organization of nurse leaders. Uh, <laughs> But so they guess she got this email and she could see that she could submit an abstract and then if you clicked on the link, it would give you more information about it. I'm wondering if it's still actually active. Yeah, here you go. So this is what she got. Nice. And when she, if you click on learn more, it gives you the tracks and basically some more information about what they're really looking for. Surprise, it's still open actually. So that's just an example of, a, of one associated with a um, specific organization. Also, there's uh, for our reimbursement policy, I've attended a conference out in like Denver and um, before signing up and paying for anything, I made sure it would be something I could get reimbursed for because a lot of the conferences I feel like we go to are free, free to us as Hopkins employees. So whenever I see like, you know, $500 charge, I'm like, oh, yeah. so we can finagle a way to get that paid for because it's really um i feel like i wrote a whole just argument on how me being able to go to this conference i could like learn things bring it back do like a blog post about it for my department so you can really um you learn a lot from it and kind of show what's in it for you if you let me go to this and to be able to get sponsored i guess yeah, I don't know. I know the emergency department, they had a specific policy about who could attend, how often you could attend. They give priority to people who are presenting versus people who are attending. So I'm not sure if that's true for Department of Medicine too. 
I think generally if you're submitting a poster, the department will pay for like one person at least, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, you know, to be able to go. Yeah. I mean, those conference fees can get high. Like I think magnets like one to $2,000. It's a lot. Um, so uh, sometimes people say, well, I'm doing a project. Um, can I just take it, like take it um, on a, what's it called, a roadshow, where you take it to all the different conferences, say, oh, I want to, I actually want to go to Denver, so I think I'm going to submit it to Denver, and then I think I also want to go to Orlando, so I'm going to submit it to another conference in Orlando. So uh, there's not, from what I can, what I've seen, I've looked it up, there is not a specific, like, written rule about when and how you can present your poster, but sort of the rule of thumb is that you only want to submit it on um, once on each sort of level. So you would want to do once to a local. It's a little bit different with our Nursing Scholars Day or Patient Safety Summit because we try, we do really encourage people to submit things that they've already presented to Nursing Scholars Day. But in general, you would want to do one local, you could do one state, one regional, one national, and one international. So it would be cool to be like jet setting around the world to show your presentation at all these different international spots when COVID is over. Um, but really you only want to be submitting it to one um, at each level. And a lot of the conferences will ask if you've submitted that, if you've presented the work previously. Um, okay, so this is what I was getting at a little bit about um, once you, you're like, okay, this conference is uh, accepting abstracts how do I even figure out what they want? So how do they decide who is accepted? So a really important thing to do really before you look at anything is you wanna look at what the focus of the conference is and for spe specifically for larger conferences, they have tracks. So um, again, just because this is where my background is, Emergency Nurse Association, every conference, they have like five, you know, six tracks. And there'll be, you know, one will be about education, one will be about trauma, one will be about CPR, one will be about um, continuing, uh, continuing ed, things like that. So they will give, there's usually an overall theme to the conference, as well as, and it depends a lot on sort of what's happening. Some of the, some of those tracks are reoccurring, but if something, like I can't imagine that next year they're not going to have a COVID track. Um, so that's a lot of times also dependent on sort of what's happening in the world and what any new information that's coming out. So they actually, I think um, when we submitted a couple of years ago, they had a mass casualty incident um, track and uh, a couple other things as well that don't necessarily occur every year. So you want to make sure that your poster is both hitting the overall theme of the conference as well as you're going to pick the track that makes the most sense. One thing to remember is for the most part, and I, I don't think this is 100%, but for the most part, when they're deciding on abstracts, they're gonna pick a certain number of abstracts from each track. So if there's 100 abstracts submitted to five different tracks, they're not gonna pick, just rank them and pick the top 20. They're gonna pick four from each one, if that makes sense. So it sometimes can be advantageous to submit to a track that you think has less interest or less submissions because you're in a smaller pool. They usually want representation kind of across what they have said are priorities for that conference. And so they're going to rank people within a track, not overall. Does that make sense? I'm going to explain myself. Okay. Um, and then you want to make sure too that you're meeting all the requirements. Um, I've definitely been really excited about submitting a poster and then went and looked really closely at all the guidelines and it turns out that I don't have a specific piece that they're asking for and so I should just either um, wait to the following year or save my time and not write up something that I know isn't going to be accepted if I can't check all their boxes. Um, for example, Magnet, they always want outcomes. If you don't have outcomes, there's you don't need to submit because um, they're not going to accept it. Um, so making sure you hit, you're actually able to address everything they want. And they're usually pretty prescriptive, again, in the larger conferences about what type of information you're gonna be submitting to them. They usually give you the kind of big categories that you need to include. And I know with, um, cause I know you guys have both submitted to Nursing Scholars Day, we've gotten pretty specific as well about the exact buckets that we want you to hit. Um, <clears throat> Some people find that really helpful. I'm one of those people that finds it really helpful. I want you to tell me exactly what you want. 
in how many words you want it, in the order that you want it in. I love having just like a list of things to go down, but I also know that some people prefer to have a little bit more space and flexibility and creativity. Um, so some, sometimes conferences are very open and they're just like, share with us what you'd like. Um, an example of that is the AONL conference. We, they had a, um, something called like a lightning round. And basically they wanted you to share any sort of innovation, but you didn't, it could be anything. It didn't necessarily need to be a specific project, but it could be, we ended up submitting um, about using data to drive nursing decisions. Um, you know, like we collect a lot of data about discharge times, admit times, um, triage times, all that, and how you can turn that into actionable direction for your nurses. And so we submitted that to the lightning round track and we called it like using big data to guide decisions or something like that. And it was accepted, but then unfortunately it got canceled because of COVID. Um, but that's just an example of there's a lot of different little pieces of a conference that you can probably try and fit your puzzle piece into. Do you guys have any questions about any of that so far? Okay. So um, again, uh, we talked a little bit about the submission process. I pulled up that screenshot from the ENA conference previously. Um, so for the bigger conferences, they're usually automated. They're usually online. And it's going to give you prompts that will guide you basically through everything they want. <clears throat> Beyond just the abstract, they will so a lot of times want other things like objectives, references. I think Ashley now has like so much knowledge about why they want that for the CNE, um, for continuing education, to making the education planning table. They need all that information so that they're able to easily transfer that onto the um, continuing nurse education um, application documents. But basically, they're going to ask you for what they want. Um, you'd be surprised at how many times people do not give them what they want. <laughs> like if, they are, if they're telling you what they want, make sure you are doing it. Um, people tend to get, I don't know, creative, or maybe they've just forgotten to tick a box, but you would be surprised how much people aren't able to just hit those um, requirements that they're playing out pretty clearly. <clears throat> um, and then for authorship. So the there's different ways to look at authorship for conference presentations and usually it ends up being a conversation among the group who is going to be the first author. Um, the first author for the manuscript is not necessarily the first author for the conference and the, uh, the first author also is going to probably be the person that's actually submitting. There are some exceptions to that but if you are the first author you're probably going to be the um, what's referred to as the corresponding author and you're going to be going to be the one that gets the email saying hey fill out these forms, hey you were accepted, Hey, make sure you send me your slides, like all of that, um, all the admin details basically about it. Um, so the one little um, thing that can catch people is if you have a lot of authors on your abstract, you're going to have to put all their information into the online system and then they're going to have to go online and complete a conflict of interest form and or any other thing, any other things that the conference wants. And sometimes it can be like pulling teeth to get people to log onto the system to fill out that information. So it's really important when you're submitting that everyone who's on the abstract is very aware that it's happening. I mean, they should be aware anyways because you're putting their name on something, but making sure that they're aware that they're gonna have to, there's gonna be additional steps and they're gonna have to go and log in. I've literally like printed something out and chased someone around the department saying, hey, sign this because I needed to turn it in and they, they just, I could not get him to sign on and do it. Um, I have to tell you, I've, most of the nurses I've worked with have been much more um, quick to do this than some of the other people. Uh, I actually, we submitted an abstract and I was, said something to the, I was helping with it. And I said, there's a lot of people on, there's like 10 people on here. Do you think you can get them all to sign? I don't know. And she said, no, we, we can get it. And they were all nurses and they all did it in like two days. Whereas I've had to chase other people around the department, you know, like stalking their clinical schedule to get them to sign something. Nice. Um, and then the other big hint is everything that you're doing, write it in Word and save it. And then use that as your template to upload it into the submission system. I can't tell you how many times I've um, lost something because I was doing it kind of as I went and then accidentally submitted too quickly or um, <clears throat> I had to step away and it reset. 
Um, also, a lot of the online systems, they don't have spell check, they don't have a word counter, um, they don't have all that functionality that you get with Word that make your life so much easier. I've also had the, made the mistake of submitting and not having a snag when I submitted, but then realizing that I needed to have the information for something else and I didn't have it in a Word document. I only had it in like the database for that specific conference and I had to go back and try and figure out what the heck I did. So always write it and save it in Word and then you're set to enter it into any system that you might want to in the future. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention with this is, um, have you guys heard of Bloom's Taxonomy? I've heard of it, but always forget it when I need it. <laughs> I love well, this I, graphic. I by no means know it. I Google it every time that I need, need it. But the reason I'm bringing this up is a lot of times the conferences are going to ask you for learning objectives related to the, to your post, to your presentation, poster, or podium. And sometimes they'll explicitly ask, but I actually just use it all the time now because it's helpful for me, is they'll, they want you to use verbs from Bloom's taxonomy. So basically from, and I know very little about this, this is an educator um, tool that I just don't know that much about, but I do know that basically from the bottom of the pyramid, that's like the most basic understanding of something where you can, you know, cite it back, you can list it, you can repeat it all the way up to the top where you have full mastery and you're able to not, you're able to take the concept and make new things from it. Um, so I, th I think when I do this, I tend to pick words from like the bottom, probably two or three, um, remember, understand and apply, but it's helpful um, to know that this exists if they ask you for Bloom's taxonomy wording, um, that's, this is what they mean. And again, you can literally Google it and it come, brings up all these verbs. I also, again, I think it's helpful because sometimes I get stuck on what to write. And if I can look at this, it gives me the first word, which is really helpful sometimes. Because sometimes, sometimes I find myself just repeating, the participant will describe, the participant will describe, the participant, or the participant will explain, 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 and you're just being redundant. And so if you want to get a new word that means something similar, this is a really good tool. I like it too, because it's really like a hierarchy. So at, at least you, your participants should be able to define lists, whatever. But like, I'm thinking now of like a college course certification, that's where you get to that very top, like by the end of this four month long, program, you will be able to design your own system, you know, so I like the hierarchy nature of this. Yeah, and I think it helps you realize like what's, I mean, a 15 minute presentation, is it possible for someone to learn how to construct a new version of what you're talking about? Probably not. Yeah. Um, so just, again, so this is Bloom's taxonomy. It's a hierarchy of learning, basically, and then verbs associated with it to help you write out your objectives. Um, all right, we, do you guys want me to keep going or do you want to take a break now? We're going to switch to actually creating the poster. Yeah, why don't we take a, like five or, is nine o'clock too far away from now? I guess feeling Ashley and Raven. Good. Okay, well that. So we'll take a break and come back at nine. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, on the break, I did um, look a little closer at this AONL um, abstract submission um, information. It's the American Organization for Nursing Leadership. I couldn't remember if it was American. Um, but I just wanted to point out that they, this is what I was sort of talking about, how they have these different um, formats. So they have a five minute Ignite session. They have a 10 minute Enlight session group discussions, podium presentations, poster presentations. Um, and so those are all the different types of formats you can submit. And then if you scroll down, they are telling you what the requirements are, um, including um, adhering to the content priorities for AONL 2021. And uh, if you come up here, it actually says that this is, they want things about the the sustainability of healthy and empowering in work environments in which caregivers are able to provide excellent patient care. 
So they really want things that are related to a healthy workforce and environment. So if you were going to write about putting in central lines, you know, maybe that wouldn't be the best time, best year to submit. Um, and then they actually come down here. So it's not letting me do it because I don't think it's open right now, but you would click on one of these and it would start to walk you through the submission process. Um, they won't let me type, but it'll, it, it's giving me what it's going to be asking for. And again, this would be a great time where you would write it in a Word document so you know all the prompts and then go ahead and fill it in here. Um, and then this is the category, they're telling you they're basically the rubric that they're going to use to evaluate your abstract. And so here, these are the six things that they're looking for. Relevance, impact, evidence, originality, application, and cogency. Um, so it's not, for a lot of these, it's a little bit more, they're more focused on um, educational or like innovative topics versus for like reporting on a presentation. They don't have a lot of space for that, I think, in this type of conference. So they're all, they're all different. Um, so that, I just wanted to point all that out. Um, all right, Holly, do you want to take us to creating a poster? Yeah, so I kind of want to just start off by gauging your guys' experience going to conferences and seeing what you liked, what you didn't like when you were at, at that poster viewing session. So for me, it, you know, if a poster has too many words on it that it's like hard for me to read, um, I know some, somebody's there to explain it all, but while I'm listening, I like to kind of read it too. But if there's, if there's like really small print and just too much on it, I think things get lost, you know, mm -hmm. like the main, the main point gets lost through all those different words on there. Thanks. Good point. How about you, Raven? Um, yeah, I would second what Ashley said as far as like the wording and like just it just being too busy um, of a poster. But I really like when um, it's like visual or like other like pictures or even something like tangible to like catch me and draw me in. I know mm -hmm. like obviously all posters necessarily depending on what you're presenting about can't have that. But it's one of those things that like even if the presenter has like candy or something like that. It, you never <laughs> know. There's something that just draws me to like just their poster and like this differentiates them from the other uh, presenters next to them. Yep. Yeah, I was gonna say, I like you mentioned the candy. I don't know if you guys remember, I think from a couple of years ago at Nursing Scholars Day, two people from the biocontainment unit were there and they were wearing, well, at this point it's a little less novel, but at the time it was um, not as soon as much, but they were wearing their all their cappers and their gowns. So they were like in full gear. Um, and it just, they looked silly, honestly, but they, but they had a ton of people come up and talk to them because they, you could, they stood out. They were wearing yellow gowns and cappers. Um, so again, it's a, that's not as, maybe as fun now, but it was just something to bring people over because you're usually in a sea of posters in that setting, there's 50 posters. So like, why does someone want to come and read yours versus the one next to it, you know? That's so true. And I'm also thinking of, um, I feel like there was a bedpan tacked up to one of the poster presentations, just like supplies that you're using, drawing people in. And there was one, like a catchy title, a waffle a day keeps the redness away. And you're like, waffle, what's this about? We're nurses. So it's like, they really draw you in. And I'm, I'm never like inclined to be like corny like that, but it really gets like, people want to know what's going on with this. So, um, yeah, I agree. Candy's a good tip. Um, I, I was going to mention with the titles, I feel like I see that people tend to get accepted. I don't know. This is anecdotal. This is not based on any actual information. But no data to support this claim. No data to support this claim. But people get accepted with catchy titles. Like there's all these silly titles that make people, they tend to get pitched more, I think. So having something super technical that's more descriptive, I think, isn't as appealing as something um, that's like draws like in your curiosity kind of you're like yeah like what the heck why would we be talking about waffles no, yeah <laughs> right and it's not something you can publish in a journal so why not have a little fun for your poster presentation you know yeah for sure raven do you have a title for your poster presentation already yeah it was something really boring though because i wasn't really in my creative 
realm that day and I was just like I just have to think of something <laughs> okay all right that's good yeah so, I mean but it is like straight to the point though like I think yours is transplant medication side effects education but you know it, it does sound boring but like another thing with some of the posters the title seems confusing too you know and it's not just what is this about yeah so at least yours is pretty straightforward <laughs> Right. That's all. And I saw the website Maddie was sharing like eight words or less. So to have to capture a year's worth of project and planning and everything just in like eight words so the reader can just know what they're about to witness, that's, it's hard. It's daunting. Yeah. So I think it's a balance between being like cutesy and being informative. <laughs> you can like find the middle ground there. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I don't think they have to be cutesy. So Raven, I love, I love your title. It's good. So um, you guys mentioned like the, just the words and so much stuff on a poster making it hard to see. So um, I, we like to use the term white space. Like there's gotta be a good balance of white space on your poster. If it's just all head to toe, filled up with content, pictures, whatever, then it's just overwhelming. Um, when you're looking at pictures versus text, how you wanna portray the information, make sure any of the pictures that you're using add value to it. I'm thinking about, we did an EBP for Scholars Day last year on reducing medical device related pressure injuries. And one of the wound care nurses was like, let's put a picture of like a trach pressure injury on this poster. And at first I was like, uh, I don't know, but it, it worked and it drew people to it. They're like, okay, this is what you're trying to prevent. This is like a real thing that's a problem that's ugly and we don't want this be happening to our patients. So um, let me read about what the evidence says from your poster to not do it. And then Ashley, you mentioned like the tininess of the words, really the size of the text is so important. And that's, it's hard to gauge too, because you're typing it on your computer and it's not printed yet. So sometimes, I don't know if any of the ones, um, the websites we were looking at, but sometimes there is like a recommended text size, whether it's like, I don't know, 30, 36, Maddie, do you know, for posters? Yeah, so on a, on a three foot by four foot, so 36 by 48 printed poster, size 40 font, four zero, is one inch high to like give you a um, context. So, I mean, one inch really isn't very tall, especially if you think you're stepping back a couple feet. So I wouldn't, I really wouldn't make anything smaller than a 40. Mm -hmm. um, but to make sure that you're doing that correctly, you have to make sure that your poster has been sized um, in, um, in the ones, the templates we have for nursing scholars, they are already the correct size, but you want to make sure you size it so that your font size is, um, congruent with how large it will actually be printed. Yep. Thank you. And, um, so we have JHH templates, which you're aware of. I'll show them to you in a second, but on the next slide, we have, um, different podcasts and video things available to, uh, um, how to create a poster. It's kind of the same information we're talking about here. And then we also are, have a podcast coming about how to resize your PowerPoint slides. So it's like Maddie was saying, the correct size. Because right now, if we're working off of just a blank PowerPoint slide, it's just going to be like an 8 by 11 size. But you can actually reformat the um, actual template on PowerPoint. So it's whatever size it needs to be for your poster presentation. And then you can um, adjust the font size. So it's actually like 40. Because if I've actually sent a normal eight by 11 slide to be printed, and by the time they blow it up, it's pixelated, it's bad. The printer's like, this isn't gonna work. You need to send us a bigger picture. So it's important to do that before you start your poster, making sure it's the size that you need it to be. Yeah, I had a colleague print some, she was one of the administrative coordinators and she was tasked to print it and she printed it and it ended up being like this big because <laughs> it was just not the right size. And we can definitely, if you guys are cu curious what we're talking about, about resizing the poster, um, we can also show you um, like um, after one of the breaks or something, how to, to resize it if, that, if you are curious about what we're talking about. Thank you. So um, the next slide has a our template for EVP posters. Um, a lot of times when you're doing a poster presentation, they might have a template already available to you at the whatever conference it is, similar to how uh, we provide this one for Nursing Scholars Day. 
Um, I do want to point out this is like a recommended template. You're definitely able to make the boxes bigger, smaller, get rid of one. Like I've gotten rid totally of the references box and just have a printout of all the references that I use um, just so I can have more um, areas for like my synth. I had too many things that I wanted to synthesize. So that's helpful. Yeah, and um, the other thing is I keep in mind too that you can change like, like these, there's these um, outlines of the text box and those were included just so you like knew it was there. But th you can add those, you can take them away. So sort of playing around sometimes with those types of things will um, give you a lot more white space. So it's really, a template is just, is just that, it's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, one of, this is the one that's available for Nursing Scholars Day um, for EBP projects. Yeah, and I guess I will add, once you have all your poster stuff together, have someone else proofread it and just make sure um, there's no errors. It like looks good at a glance, the fonts all the same font and everything looks good. Okay, so podium presentation, similarly to how I asked about the poster, what has stuck out to you as um, like a good podium presentation, not so good? What are things that you like to see, not like to see when, from your experience with podiums? Um, for podium presentations, I like when the presenter is actually like mobile kind of, I guess you mm. could say, and not just uh, stuck in one place behind the podium, but it's like yeah. trying to encapsulate the whole audience. So like moving back and forth and like, you know, just spanning uh, and really utilizing the stage. I feel like that also like helps me, I don't know, like depending on how long it can be it helps me like focus and like just try to make sure okay well now she's over here so like let me just focus over here so it's not necessarily <laughs> like boring in a way too kind of but just little things like that yeah thank you i like when they have just quick main points on their slides but they explain the more in-depth stuff you know just verbally so that the slide doesn't have a ton of writing on it it's just the bullet points of what they are discussing. Yeah, that's helpful. Maddie. Um, yeah, I I feel like I it's the things that got to me more that like were done really poorly <laughs> than the things that were done really well. Um, but I I think I like I I'm very good at reading. I've been reading since I was a child. So I don't need someone to read to me. So um, I've seen people, I've even, this is the worst example I've ever had was someone um, at a conference took their abstract and put it on a slide and then read it like from front to back. And it was um, very difficult to be engaged in that presentation. Um, so I think I actually recently was doing some um, research or some investigation about poster, present, poster and podium presentation tips and one of the big ones was um, you should be able to give your presentation even if the equipment fails. Like, for, so for some reason, this projector isn't working that day, the computer doesn't work, you can, you aren't crippled. Like, you're still able to go ahead and give what you need, give the information you need to give. That, that is a great and daunting tip. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, Raven, you're also reminding me, like, I love just people walking around the room just staring me down, making me look them in the eye, like, yes, give me that. I want to see that. So it's true. Walking around, having someone talking and engaging every single person in the room, making them feel like, oh, she is talking to me. I'm paying attention. Let me see what I can get. So yeah, that's helpful for me too. Yeah. So, I, think, I was going to say, I think that if you can do that, that also shows that you're not reading off your slide because you can't look yeah. at and read at the same time. So it's like a good way yes. to make sure that you're not just you know, reading to people. Right, total power move, I love it. So um, similarly, length of your presentation, use, utilizing pictures, text. Maddie's really good about using like the animation features of PowerPoint, which is like fun, because you know, oh, I didn't expect that little bubble to pop up. Um, being engaged in what we're talking about and then using graphs and figures to support and enhance anything that you're talking about, really making sure it's value added. Um, Another thing, like Maddie's really good about having a picture, like just think the project from a little sprout to like a big plant from the beginning of this and 
um, being able to speak to whatever picture you're using and relating it to the content is helpful. Um, I love polling, like I love using Kahoot, getting my phone out, um, participating, seeing, I know, hike, do you guys go to the Clapsy Champion meetings? They're really good about using um, Kahoot and different things to get the crowd involved, especially if it's like a huge auditorium of people and having a like a competition with each question that you're doing and seeing your name up on the screen and making it like really engaging, that's helpful. Um, we talked about not reading off the slides. And then it's also helpful to use a team. So if you have a project that you did with somebody else, um, having that person there and you can bounce off each other, having a good idea of who's presenting what though. And um, like Maddie and I, when we're presenting, we try not to have like, okay, you do this slide, I'll do that slide, you do this slide, I'll do that slide. We you know, organize ahead of time who's gonna be presenting what type of information. And then I do wanna mention that podium presentations, they could be, educational like with content or they could be project based where it's taking you through the life of a project so just know that there's kind of two different probably more than two but those are the two main ones we see in nursing inquiry anyway and the objectives kind of help get the learner um, oriented to what they're getting into yeah, and I just wanted to make one more one plug too about um, polling and things like that. If you're going to use that, make sure you try ahead of time to make sure it works because there's definitely, I think we've all been there where there's a presentation and they're fiddling with the technology and you end up wasting time trying to make something work versus actually getting through the, um, getting through the activity. So, um, and because also a lot of places have, um, you know, like firewalls and things like that if you're off mm -hmm. campus. So getting there a little early to make sure your technology works can really save you a lot of embarrassment when you're standing up there and you're trying to figure something out with 30 people staring at you. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Cause I'm one of those, I like get impatient with technology problems when I'm sitting there and with like an audience, I'm quickly just like, okay, what, what's the next thing I can get to? Cause it needs to be working and you're so good about making sure that things are working, Maddie. I am grateful for you. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, what is happening with this? This is a poster from Google. Oh gosh, it has people's names on it. No, okay, it's not. We we got this. Um, so, what do you guys? What's your first impression when you see this poster? Sorry if I you're biased now because of what I just said. I think it's amazing. No, <laughs> uh, it's all over the place. I'm confused at what's happening. You got like okay. the white noise background. The <laughs> Yeah, there's literally too many, like graphs and tables like they're really important, but which is the most important like what should I look at there's a lot of different graphs there's that table that you can't even see, you know, and then there's results. Um, there's a lot of results, but th there's just too much like what should I focus on. Yeah. No, oh, this is great it's on the bottom left vast tables of data are unnecessary and are hard to read and then this. I like the conclusions thing too. Many audience members only read the figures and the conclusions of the work. An effective poster will have the conclusions near the bottom right as most people from read from left to right, top to bottom, and they'll add to the results and not just repeat the title. Anyway, I'm not gonna read this all to you, but yes, I love this. Um, okay, next, next poster, please. Ah, uh, so much better, right? what what is it about this one that makes it better nice and neat <laughs> a little better organized as far as like um just where the images are and it's not like a lot of graphs to look at or anything and still a lot of words kind of but I, it, since it's neat and the colors don't clash as much it's the more appealing to my eyes where i'm like okay i can read it though mm -hmm. not, that, not that bad yeah, like Raven said, it's definitely more appealing to the eyes. Um, there's good like white space and like I'm immediately drawn to the center. I'm like, what's this Ames? You know, like yeah. that brought me right in. Whereas the other one, I just, it was all like the same. I didn't know where to look. Um, and I can clearly see like their methods. It's, it's just more organized. Mm -hmm. I also like how, um, they're, you know, it is wordy, but they're, it's bulleted, 
which is easier for my mind to like just skim through bullets rather than like paragraphs upon paragraphs. So we have an activity. Um, I sent you guys an email recently with a activity poster example. So we're going to, I guess we can pull it up together, Maddie, and talk through it, work through it, or independently and come back. So the plan was if we had more people um, that we would have you guys go to a breakout room. Um, Holly sent you a, a, basically a bad poster that we want you to take time um, as a pair to fix, really. Um, and so I think, I think anyone's able to share their screen. So I don't know um, if one of you wants to pull it up and then um, you guys can work together to change it. And then we can sort of go over it as a group. I can um, pause the recording. I'm it up now so I could share it once I get it up. Okay, thank you. Let me stop my share. So would you guys like to just sort of talk through it and all sort of change it or do you want to the two of you work together and then we'll and then you can sort of show us what you did. Um Ashley, do you have it up? Okay. I think we can work through it. Can I see it? Just change it. Okay, so I'll so so keep recording and just um, I'll stay on. Yeah. Okay. You guys see it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. So first, I don't know. What do you think, Raven? I don't like um, first. The, the way it's organized, it's just, I don't know how to really say what it's, how it's not appealing to me, but <laughs> the way well, it's organized. Here. First, I don't know, there's too much color, I think. Yeah. I don't know if I can, um, like color's not bad, but it's just, it's almost like, it's just way too much. Yeah. Oops. I don't know if that's gonna fix. Okay, well, that ain't too good. Okay. Um, and then I guess how they have yeah. Oh, so this is an A three. Okay, that's why it looks the way it does. It's an A three. But still, it's all kind of crazy. Okay. But with a with the A three template, I know that it's like that. Is there a way we can reorg not reorganize but like yeah, simplify the like. Cool charts and stuff all right there's just like i almost want to get rid of something we almost need to like get rid of something so we have more space right what do you think we can get rid of let me make up there we go mm -hmm. this is all crazy all right, let's do an analysis of each cat scores. I'm sorry. I feel like the analyze and improve and then the action plan, like, are they, is that basically mm -hmm. just saying the same thing? Same thing as what? Like, it's just repeating itself of what it's, what we're doing, kind of, with the sustain and then, like, the analyze and improve and then the sustain section. So, like, the action plan, like, how that chart, like, lays out the errors. And then okay. you have to plan these studies. So, like, I feel like one of the graphics can go away to, like, explaining the process of what it's doing. So, this is, like, the plan do study act. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. But then you have it, like, all in detail up at the top. So, it's... Yeah. Like, repeating itself so do we need to have that much detail in depth or do we just want to make it simplified so that way okay so like all this stuff we can get rid of yeah all
So then this, that's what I need. Okay. What is this? What is the H cat? That's the metric. That's basically how they help staff go. Well, that's good because that is that's part of their what they yeah. did. Where's where's like the results? That's what I'm trying to read and find. <laughs> There's a text too, um, right above what you have clicked on. What does that say? That's really faint, like a real light orange. What does that say to me? H caps domain. No, like right under benefits. Oh, uh, root cause analysis. That is super faint. Why is that even there? Can't read that. Read that block. There we go. <laughs> I almost want to like combine this or something or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause like if we read from left to right, I'm still trying to figure out where our results would like where they had the results. Yeah, exactly. Because to increase the score. So is the metric, is that metric before or after there? Because that would technically be the result. Because if they are trying to increase the scores, that would show us if the if it happened. Yeah, let's see. Quarter one through four, they went up a little bit. But they, yeah, so they still don't have their information almost. It's almost just saying what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We might need some help from our, we need a phone a friend. <laughs> Already? Oh my gosh, it looks so much better. <laughs> <laughs> changing the background made it like 50%. I know. Yeah. yeah. Like color's okay, but it just, ah! <laughs> Okay, so um, one thing that's sticking out to me is what you guys mentioned with the results, like trying to figure out what are we even measuring here. So looking at the background statement, it looks like, you know, they're talking about staff responsiveness. The goal just mentioned staff responsiveness. And in general, on any kind of like A3, having one metric should be the goal. Like there shouldn't be four different goals there. Because already like that on the key metric, that little table, like what am I even looking at? Right. Even the best way to display it like on a table because you're, the reader can't see an improvement just by like this weird table, right? And right, if we're looking at staff responsiveness here, why did we have medication side effects and all those yeah. other things? No, yeah. Okay. Um, did you guys agree with like the thing we got rid of there under the plan do study and just kind of put this there instead? There, yeah, what, there was definitely way too much information yeah. on there. So it looked like um, those little arrows above the table on the left are showing like when the time that each intervention was put in place. But like, why do I want to see 11 different interventions if you're yeah. talking about one project? Like, I don't, I just want to know what are my baseline? What's my intervention that's going to, make a difference and what's my 
post data points. Like I don't need to have 11 different. Right. And then your improve, analyze, and technically the analysis where, you know, where it says analyze and improve at the top right, mm -hmm. the analyze is that, that root cause analysis on the bottom left. So like already this is weird. Oh, so move that. You don't have to, I was just pointing it out. I, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so what's another way we could display that data maybe? Unless you like the table. Um, this data. Like display the, the, the key metric data or the, the root yeah, cause? The key metric data, sorry. I mean, I like the table now that we've condensed it to just mm -hmm. the one um, the one metric that we're working on. Mm -hmm. And got rid of those, the arrows. Because, right. I mean, whether or not you show an intervention, looking at the scores, you know, you want to see, you just look at the scores anyways to see are yeah. they going up or are they, they went down, you know? Right. I would... I um I see this all the time, and I kind of harp on this point with people too. Is I'm I don't really know much about HCAP, so when I look at the number seventy two, I have no idea. Is that a percentage? Is That's that seventy two out of a thousand? Is it seventy two out of a hundred? And so having units is super important. Um, so you can either put a unit with each um, number, or you can um, write the unit that you're going to use in the label of the column. So that would be staff responsiveness, but um, you really need to assume that the person who's reading it knows very little about the subject. And so making assumptions about um, rates and things like that that are used really commonly in your world is you need to make sure you explain those to somebody else. Yeah, that's a good point. We do that with fall rates too, like you said. Right, and even maybe having some kind of red, green, like is, is 72 are we always in the red until we get like that court that 70 down to 50 is a huge drop what does that mean is that before or after my intervention do we want it to right. be higher or lower yes yeah, so yeah because there is a bar for h caps and i just know you know but you want to there's a benchmark see a benchmark you know so mm -hmm. we need to have that because why do i want to get uh, staff response, why do I want to increase by three top box percent points? You know, what is the benchmark? Where should it be in the first place? So I think mm -hmm. the definition of what is the benchmark? Right. Right. If we dropped 20 and we only want to go up three, like, is that even fine? Right. And you mentioned that goal, like, when is this with the SMART goal? What's the time frame that you want to be? <clears throat> having that improvement by, you know. Yeah, and I, I like what Holly said with the colors so that if someone's walking up to this, they can just see, oh, good, bad, um, if it's like mm -hmm. red or green, um, without having to necessarily try and really look at the trends and things like that. It's just a really, that gives you a really quick overview of what the information is telling us. Mm -hmm. Do we need to put the... control plan over to the left before the root cause analysis maybe because that's what we're planning to do and then that's what we did and then we can in analyze actually what happened. So I like that thought. The control plan is mainly after you've achieved your results, how are you going to sustain your results? And then, um, so this, what does it say? peer evaluation, rating each employee's engagement and rounding. So this is like, how, what are you going to put in place to make sure you're okay. gaining the game? Yeah. Yeah, this is looking much better. There's just, can you double check that all the font is the same? Because there's something that's just Really like this is driving me crazy. The team members, yeah, oh, this is really shady for a lot of reasons. Thanks. We oh, 
Um, do, yeah, Maddie, yes, format Peter. One moment. Okay, wait, let me show you how to do something cool. Okay, so which font do you want it to look like? Like, what's your um, master um, font, kind of? Calibri looks fine. This is Calibri. Yeah. Okay, so double click one of the words in that box. Okay, now go up to the left hand corner and click on Format Painter. It's right next to Paste. Okay, and now go to the, oh, you already changed it. It's not the same size. Oh, because I didn't do oh, this okay. one. And then um, select what you want it to be the same as the responsiveness. Um, so you wanted to change the team members, right? Yeah. You already changed well, it. So, I did, yeah. Um, um, so then that, okay. Um, so it'll take, it's basically going to copy the formatting of whatever you select. And then it's going to transfer that formatting to another piece of the, to wherever you, what, the next thing that you select. Um, so that, so instead of trying to like go up and be like to figure out what something it was before and then remember it and then select a new thing and then change it, you can just select what the formatting that's like your master formatting and then, um, yeah, and then that little paintbrush comes up and it's going to make it the same, see it's making it the same size as that original. I like it. Okay. And this works um, in all PowerPoint, Excel, um, Word, and it works for not only fonts, but it also works for images. So if you like um, create a border around an image that you want to be on all the images for the rest of your presentation, if you click on the, the one that you sort of have all set up, hit Format Painter, and then click on the next image, it's going to transfer that format to the following image. Will it work for these colors for these arrows? Because that's also bothering me. Like, I just want the, the colors for the arrows to be the same if we're doing the. What's I don't know. Let's arrows. try it. You mean like make the do um, gray? gray. Yeah. 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 Let's see what, it, let's see what happens. No. Yeah. It just made the font crazy. Ah. Yeah. So I guess it won't work for color. But do you know how to change colors? Oh, you can go to design at the top. I just right clicked and then the fill. Oh, oh look at you. Is that helping you, Raven? That yeah. see that does look that makes more sense. I like it. And do you know right? Can you right click again, Ashley? Mm -hmm. Or do what you were doing. Um, the, with the fill. Just want to point something out. There we go. So see where um, yeah, go to the fill menu. Mm -hmm. See where that um, eyedropper is? It's like in the middle. It's under more oh, fill yeah. colors. Yeah. If you click on that, you can use that to pick up any other oh. color in your presentation. And like sometimes with Hopkins, that blue is like a very specific blue mm -hmm. that I can never yeah. figure out. And so if you do that, then you can it'll you can click on the blue that you want, and it's going to transfer it to the other parts of your presentation. Um, I've done that too with like, if I have an image and I like the color of the image and I want to tie the whole thing together, mm -hmm. you can hold the eyedrop over literally any part of the presentation. So even like a picture, like if, so if you like the color of the sky or something, and then you can use that color throughout your presentation. It really ties things together. Nice. Okay, guys, I'm so proud of you. This looks great. <laughs> So this is, um, this was my poster. Um, I was wondering who Flashy McFlash a lot is. I mean, that does sound like you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I like, I love A3s. I think it's a great way to keep track of what you're doing um, and all the little interventions just to keep track of them. But when I first learned about them, I like wanted to make them pretty to be able to print them out and post them on my unit and try get people's attention. And then, you know, the more uh, scholarly I became, I realized like, okay, this is not, this is doesn't look good. This is like, oh, so um, this looks great. Also, if you go to design, Ashley, I think there's a way to like, that's where you were with the, um, when you first started changing the colors but you can change the whole color scheme there too. I think on the, is there a thing on the right? My camera. Like variants. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, I loved how, yeah, the colors thing. So you, oh, okay. Right. And then if you're having this printed, it's good to have the Johns Hopkins logo. So that's really where you need, oh, that's cute. That's where you need your directors to be able to um, sign off on this presentation saying like, okay, this is a Hopkins employee representing Johns Hopkins Hospital. So it's good to have that. All right, so thanks. What are, um, you can stop sharing, Ashley, if you want. Actually, can I just point out two quick things before yeah, we- I'm having fun with the color. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention, and this happens a lot, is people, when you make a table, for some reason, sometimes the font, the font doesn't maximize itself to the space it's in. And so you can actually yeah. make things much more readable, not by making your table bigger, but by making the font within the table bigger. So if you click on, um, on your left-hand side where it says HCAPS domain, mm -hmm. um, like if you highlight that, <clears throat> and then just make that font like three sizes bigger, it's gonna make it so much more readable. Um, you can click on the, yeah, that or the A with the up. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. There so we that's go. like instantly more readable, but you're not taking up any more space. You're just making sure that the font fills the space of the cell it's in. Um, and then do you guys, and I just wanted to point out since we have it open, it would be a good time to show you. Do you know how to resize the slides? Yeah. Mm, no, yeah. Okay, so you're actually already halfway there because it's under the design tab, which is where you are right now. And then if you go to the top right hand corner, it says format background and then to the left of that it says slide size. Okay. So pull, pull that down. And then um, click on custom size, custom slide size. And then, so right now it's 13.3 inches by 7.5 inches. So I guess it's going to be printed on like a legal paper, maybe? Because um, regular paper is 8 by 11. <laughs> we need help here. <laughs> um, so again, traditionally a poster, and it's sometimes it's different by conference, but um, sort of safe bet is three feet by four feet. So that's um, a width of 48 inches and a height of 36. So you can just um, type it in. Would that information be on, um, like, when you submit or anything like that, exactly what size the poster would be? Um, it should be. Not necessarily when you submit, but when they give you a, hey, congratulations, you're accepted. Here, is some, here are details about, like, how you're actually going to, the logistics of how you're going to display your poster. Um, honestly, like, you, it, sometimes it's not quite as accessible as you think it would be. Sometimes I've had to reach out and even ask. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing like a physical poster presentation, um, again, thinking of Scholars Day, like, you know, we have those big boards. And so if it fills up two thirds of the board versus like 75% of the board, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as it fits on the board. Um, so I, I would just, that's the safe assumption is the three feet by four feet, unless they tell you otherwise. Did um, I do your fit? Sure. I think I'd normally do that. Okay. Yes, this, this is what happened. Jam. Okay, so this is exactly why. Did you see? You see our poster now is yeah, it's a baby. <laughs> yes, it's because the font sizes were all like eight, nine, ten. So it's right. Okay, check your slide size before. Like if you spent all this time formatting and making your poster look beautiful, and then all of a sudden resize it, and you had to do it all over again, and you just wasted two hours of your life. Mm -hmm. Do this first. This is step one. Check the size of your, just what you're working with. Yeah, because that's tiny. <laughs> yeah. So now you're gonna have to make all of those things bigger. Oh. Okay. So I would like, to me, I would just go back, put it back to kind of a workable size. Well, actually, I could. No. Just so I can like work with it to change the fonts. Nope. Yep. That's all. What you'll have to do. Zoom in. And then you have to make every box bigger, all the fonts bigger. Oh, okay. well, can't you using the mm -hmm. tool before? Can't you just the format here? Yes. Like do the yeah. first one and then just do neck, like go down and <laughs> do the format here for all the rest of it. You them. could. That's a great point, but you still have to um, do the box. 
make the box out. Okay. In fact, if I were to do this, I'd probably control highlight each box and make them all bigger at once just to like get it big. You know? How could I control highlight like the, the boxes at the same time? So click on, yeah, okay. So you have one whole box highlighted, not like if yeah. the cursor flashing, it's not the correct um, way okay. to it. So then hit control. Yeah, there you go. And you're grabbing them all. But how am I gonna, is there like a percentage or something? Like how are they gonna get bigger? So then you just drag and drop one of the corners to be bigger. So then go to any of those little dots and make it bigger. Okay. What happens. Whoa, it's going. It's got us. Okay, so all the boxes you grabbed are bigger. Yeah. This just looks so bad. Yeah. Oh. I feel like we got to start all over. <laughs> I know. No, right. At this point, I'd probably just I can't tell withdraw. You I'd withdraw. <laughs> right. I cancel it. Yeah. I withdraw. I rescind my abstract. Right? Yeah. Um, or send it. Is there like a editing service that turns your abstract into a poster? That would be nice. We should we start a business. <laughs> Um, Ashley, can. Yeah, I, I have done this like more times than I care to admit where I spend, I'm like, Ooh, I'm all set. And I'm about to send it in and I do that and it's teeny, teeny, tiny. And I've spent like another hour dragging all those stupid boxes around again. So please learn from my mistake. <laughs> I know ha Ashley Raven, that's half, half the battle. That's like where all our content comes from that we want to give to you is just like learn from our mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Where, so would it be best to first open up your slide, go to design and make it the right size and then work on it? Okay. Yeah. Raven, did you hear that? <laughs> yep. I'm glad that this yeah. was said to me now before I start this process. Well, it's yeah. virtual, right? So yeah, right, right, right. That's what I was about to say. Like on it for this, for a virtual one, since you're not actually printing anything physical. Right. It would be. You could get away with doing it. The other way. Raven, are you just printed? Are you just virtual? Or are you also printed? I can't remember. I'm just virtual. Okay. Yeah, it matters less. And I think that um, I'll double check, but I'm fairly certain I went when we made the templates, we sized them correctly so that yeah. they're already so. where they're supposed to be. Well, Raven, I was going to talk to Amy too about if we could even just print your poster and have it on the unit. So do it the right way so that, you know, we could still print it and just put it on the unit, you know, yeah. and it would be it. Um, the Nursing Scholars Day because it's virtual now. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, all right. So Ashley, if you want to stop sharing, thank you for doing that. Let's stop working on it too. I know you want to. I wanted to like save it, you know, <laughs> like save it. Don't work on it. It's gonna. It's good. You did great. Good job, guys. Um, all right. Let me just get this pulled back up again. One second. Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and now start talking about journals. Um, <clears throat> the only other thing I just wanted to mention is um, when, when I'm doing a poster or any even more so a podium presentation, and again, because um, I've, I've read some um, guidance and, you know, there's like some actually pretty big people, the people who like organize like TED Talks and stuff, they have um, guidance about how to do a really good presentation. And they talk about too, like, what's your, what's your message? what do you want people to walk away with? And you should do that before you've even started writing anything. Like you take a second to sit back. And so when you guys started looking at that poster and feeling so lost in it, that was the first thing I thought of is, well, what do I want people, what's the purpose of this? What do I want people to walk away with? And that should be the thing that you're really focusing on and anything else is just supporting it, but really honing in on what the message is, the key message is gonna let you call so much content because it, it does, it's all, extra as opposed to what you're really trying to get them. Like Holly, do you remember what the, like, what was the takeaway message for your poster? Do you remember? Literally just to organize, like keep track of the things, but it's so true. And there's, it's really like an elevator pitch. If you ever heard, have you guys heard that before? It's like, so if you have to explain your whole project, your whole poster 
from the time you get from the first floor of an elevator with like your CNO to the time she gets off of her floor, what, what's your just elevator pitch of what you want to um, portray? And that's really how much time you have when someone's walking by viewing your poster. You really only have a snapshot of time to draw them in, tell them everything that you want that, them to know about your poster before they're on to the next poster. So um, practice that elevator pitch for any of your posters that you have come up. And real quick, it's been about an hour since we took our last break. So do you guys want to take a little eight minute break and we'll come back at 10? Or do you, or are you okay? Do you want to keep going? I would like to take a break. I'd have to go. Okay. No problem. We'll come back at 10 o'clock. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, I'm just gonna get our, let me get, oops. Um, get our video going, or our slides again. Give me one second. Getting me problems. Okay, um, have you, uh, Raven or Ashley, have you guys ever um, submit, uh, written a publication before? No. Do either of you get, um, are you like subscribed to a journal um, through like a professional organization or anything like that? Do you, get, do you see the journals on your unit ever? Like, do you ever have journals like in your break room or anything like that? No, we've got like People Magazine, but not oh. <laughs> journals. But I mean, I know through Welch, we have access to so much stuff. It's just getting there to look at it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And actually what's nice is if you belong, like I belong to um, Emergency Nurse Association. So I actually get their journal um, monthly in the mail. So I can kind of keep up on things there, or you can actually go into Welch and then we can show you this like um, later if you're interested and sign up to, see, to get notifications when new things come out for certain journals. So if you just kind of want to be notified like every time something comes out for a transplant related journal, that you can go on to Welsh, create a little profile for yourself and it'll send you an email in the beginning of the month and tell you what came out in that journal that month. So that can sometimes be a good way to like monitor it. Yeah, Maddie, I, I'll write that down because I actually try to set that up for like nursing quality content, whether fall prevention, pressure injury prevention, and I couldn't figure it out. So maybe we can do like a tutorial on how to do that sometime. Yeah, you actually have to make a, um, I think it's called NCBI profile, the national, it's like the, it's the library, um, like the national library. I think it's actually like a government organization. Um, you make it through them and it gives you a lot more functionality in terms of how to manage your citations and things like that. Um, so, um, we're, so now we're going to talk a bit about um, journals. Uh, I know that you guys ha aren't necessarily in the place where you would be doing this yet, but we just want to give you some general information about it um, so you don't feel like you're starting from zero uh, if you get to that point. Um, so a lot of times people say, well, how do I even figure out how, which journal to publish I want to submit to. And there's um, some different ways to, to, look, to look for them, and I'm going to show you some of the databases in a couple minutes. But um, another really easy way is to think about your professional organizations. So if, you, um, if there's a critical care nursing association or a um, transplant nurse association or anything like that, a lot of times those journals have or I'm sorry, those associations have a journal associated with the organization. It's like a big part of what they do in addition to the conferences. Um, so just going to your professional organization, a lot of times they'll have an associated journal. And then there are some ways to look up different types of journals related to your subject, which I'm going to show you in a couple minutes. Um, another really good way to kind of get on the path for writing your manuscript is conference attendance. So if you present at a conference, it's I know people who have presented and they've actually had someone approach them at the conference saying, hey, we really like this. Can you write this up for the journal? So for Emergency Nurse Association at their conference, my colleague had a poster. They thought it was awesome. And they, they approached him and saying, can you write this up for um, Journal of Emergency Nursing? So um, both um, having them approach you and then also sometimes I've had this instance where I've had something accepted for a conference. And then I reached out to them after to the editors of the journal later saying, 
you know, this was accepted for your conference in 2019 it, with a lot of interest and we'd like to share more information via a publication. Is this something you'd be interested in? So that's just kind of a good way to segue from poster or podium presentation to manuscript. Um, another really big thing is really you want to think about who you want to read your article. So for example, with another group we're doing, um, we did a music for pain relief in pediatric patients. And so there's a ton of um, journals related to peds, there's a ton of journals related to pain, um, and then there's a ton of nursing journals. And so they were trying to think about who really would want, who did they want to read that information? And did they want it to be nurses? Did they want it to be providers? Did they want it to be pain specialists? Or did they want it to be pediatric specialists? Um, and so they ended up deciding that they really wanted it to be pediatric nurses, not so much the pain perspective. They wanted to inform pediatric nurses about pain versus informing pain nurses about pediatrics, if that makes sense. Um, so thinking about who you want to read your article is really important. And then some people think about the impact factor. Have you guys heard of that? So it's what it is, it's a number that's a calculation and I can never quite keep it straight, but it basically has to do with how many times that journal has been cited um, within a certain amount. It's, I think it's how many time, how many articles they've published and how many articles that have been published have been cited uh, by other journals. So it's a calculation. Um, it can be things like The Lancet and things like that have a really high um, impact factor, I think in like the 60s, um, whereas nursing journals tend to be much lower. Um, I can look it up, but I think like one of the highest is like a four a lot of them tend to be lower, like a one or a two. So that's kind of, it's not abnormal to be, you know, un, under two for nursing journals. Um, and so people tend to want to go for the journal with the biggest impact factor because that basically means you're going to have the biggest audience because that journal has more eyes on it. Um, so keeping that in mind, if you're kind of, if you have two journals, you're not sure which one you want to submit to, sometimes going for the bigger impact factor is kind of the default. Um, and then the other thing you want to think about is how competitive competitive is it to get published in that journal. Um, certain journals have a super low acceptance rate. I think um, the Journal of Nurse Administration is something really low, um, and they actually have it published on their website. I can't remember what it is now, but the you want to know basically what your chances are of getting published. And so if it's something with a really, really low acceptance rate, and you're already feeling like it's a stretch to apply to send it there, you might want to think about something else. So that's just another, not all journals are created equal in terms of who they're accepting. If you think about it almost like a Ivy League school and their acceptance rate versus like a smaller, you know, community college, things like that. Um, have you ever heard of predatory, predatory journals? So this is actually a whole other can of worms and like an ethical debate about how journals are paid for and how people are compensated or not compensated for um, contributing content and reviewing content, um, which we won't necessarily get into all the nitty gritty of that. But journals are money making um, businesses. They are usually um, run by not necessarily the the professional organization itself, but by other bigger publishing companies like Elsevier is a really big one. I think you probably heard of that. Like they publish books and things like that. You've probably seen it. And so they, um, they want to make money. And so they can do that in a couple different ways. They can do that by um, having people subscribe to the journal. So you're, you're paying a fee. Um, a lot of times it's not so much a person, but rather uh, organization. So like Johns Hopkins pays subscription fees to thousands of journals to have, so that we have access. Um, and then the other way they can do it is actually you can pay a fee to have your article published. And as a general rule, the higher the, the you really shouldn't be paying very much money to, if any at all, I've never paid any money to have your journal, to have your article published. And if they're asking for a lot of money, that should be like a red flag that it's a predatory journal. Um, and there's actually a um, website called Beals List, and this is a place where you can go to look up predatory journals. The, there is not a universally um, agreed upon definition for predatory journals, but they sort of, they tend to have the characteristics that it's, um, the peer review process is very, it's not transparent or it doesn't exist at all. Um, it has very high fees to submit or be published. Um, 
and basic, basically they don't, it's not a very reputable place um, based on their process for soliciting content and then vetting that content. Um, so you can actually, it's alphabetical or you can just go to the top and type something in here. A thing that is gonna happen, once you publish, you go into some database where your name is going to be popping up all the time and so you get you're going to start getting emails like this email that i get i get like 15 of these a day and this is for this is for a conference but you get them also for um journals saying dear um madeline so it can't it doesn't even know which is my first name and what's my middle initial my middle initials m um and this is greetings from nano drug delivery 2019 period so they're asking me, I think, to submit to a conference in London about nanopharmaceuticals and drug delivery challenges and breakthroughs, something I know absolutely nothing about. So I would, um, I spend a lot of time actually trying to unsubscribe from these emails because they really clog up my inbox. But you'll get these for both conferences and you'll get them from journals. And a, any journal, it, it is possible that you get a solicited, um, a solicited article or they're asking you to write for the journal specifically, they, they say, hey, we noticed that you did this, we really would like you to contribute X, Y, Z. But for the most part, these should be very suspect, these type of emails. And what I've done before is if it seems kind of legit, I'll go to that Beals list. Um, again, here's the link for it. Um, you can get it in your notes. Um, and I'll type it in to see if it's a predatory journal, so just to make sure I'm not like wasting my time. But for the most part at this point, I don't even read those emails because they're just junk. They are, and I'm always alerted because they're like, dear Dr. Farley, I'm like, mm -hmm. I I'm, do not have my doctorate, but, and then they'll say like, do you, we liked your journal, can you also publish it in my journal? And like, once you, once you're published, you can't publish that content somewhere else. Even like Matt, when Maddie was talking about looking at who they, which journal would best fit for the content that you're doing, you can't like, submit one to your pain article and one abstract to the peds article like you once it's published or it needs to stay with one article maybe after you submit the abstract it gets rejected then maybe you can go to the next journal to see if it would be submitted there but you can't just like submit your abstracts to a bunch of different articles like a job application you know you got to stick with one and get an answer then move to the next yeah, that's a really good point. And um, that's actually segues really well into this other portion, which is querying the editor. So like Holly said, you can't, once you've submitted, you have to actually, there's an attestation that that, uh, that information isn't under review with another journal or hasn't already been published in a journal because they actually will own the copyright to the material once it's published. So you have to attest that it's only going to them. Um, but you can send more than one query letter to an editor. And when I say query letter, it's an email, you're not sending physical letters. Um, but basically you can go on the journal's website and it's not super hard to find and you can find the, um, the journal editor's email address and you can reach out to them and say, hey, um, we're working on an article about pain. We think this might be of interest to your readers. We wanted to make sure they thought this would be a good fit. Do you think this is something that your readers would be interested in? And they can tell you right off like, no, don't even bother. We don't, that's not something that we would consider. Or yes, we would be interested in hearing more, please submit. And so that's just like a good way to get, kind of test the water a little bit. Um, what I like to do, and I can definitely share, I have some templates of these letters because I've sent out a lot of them. So I kind of have them like boilerplate. Um, but a good thing to do, what I like to do is go to a journal and either look either at the subject itself or the type of article it is. So um, for example, we did one about gamification of nursing education. And so I went to a couple journals and I just searched, have they ever published about gamification before? And if they haven't, um, then it either means that they have zero interest in it or it's something that they, it's like a gap that this, my article could potentially fill. So I will say, I noticed that you published about gamification five years ago, but haven't since. We've done an integrative review. Was this something that you would be interested in? Um, or I've noticed that you did an article about gamification um, recently, but this is, this is an overall review, whereas you had already published a quality improvement. So um, sort of referencing things that have already been published and then seeing, sort of identifying how your article might fill a gap in there for their readership. Um, it's also, oh, I just totally lost my train of thought. 
Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, it's also good to know if they a month ago published something exactly about what you're going to publish, it means that it's interesting to them, but they probably don't want it again right afterwards. So even though the topic might be interesting, the timing itself might not be appropriate because they've already just published on something. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, and yeah, so again, you can send out as many queries as you want. I would, wouldn't recommend sending out a ton because then you have to follow up and say, oh, we didn't pick you, we picked somebody else. Um, but then once you've submitted, you have to wait for a decision to be made on that submission before you can either move forward or you can submit to somebody else. All right. Um, so I had mentioned before about how the heck do you figure out even who to submit to. There are hundreds of probably thousands of journals. Of, there's thousands of journals probably, um, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of nursing journals specifically. So these are a couple, um, these are a few resources. Um, in Maine, which is like the worst acronym I've ever seen for a company. Um, it's, it's, it's not a company. It's a, um, it stands for, it's the nurse, um, sorry, it's the International Academy of Nursing Editors. So this is a published by basically all the editors of nursing journals. And this is their professional organization. And so this is a directory of nursing journals. And so you can view the nursing journals directory. And this basically, it, this one doesn't have a ton of like searching functionality, but you can go through and it tells you, I don't know why it took me to the bottom of it. Um, you can filter, you can sort, but this basically is all the different journals um, that are considered um, nursing journals. And they're in alphabetic order and it gives you a little description and it tells you who the current editor is, editor is. It actually, it seems a little bit intimidating sending an email to the editor, but they're just a person you know, like we know people who are editors, they're, they get in your email and they're, they really, for the most part, want to help you. Um, so they can be really responsive. I've been really surprised about how receptive and helpful they've been when I've reached out, but it does seem kind of scary. So this is specific for nursing journals. Um, there's also Insight, which is part of Claire, Claire via Claire, let's see. Claire of it, I don't know how you say it, um, analytics. And this um, is all different journals. I don't know why it wants me to sign in. Hmm. I've never had to sign in before. Are they all healthcare journals or all journals in general? They're um, healthcare journals and like social science journals. So there's humanities stuff in there too. I think like nature and those types of things are in there. Um, let me try one more thing. I think I can get through it. Hmm. Okay. Well, it's making me sign in. Okay. Sure. We'll skip that one for now, but basically it's a good way to look up. You can sort things by the category they're in. You can see the number of journals that are in that category. So, and you can pick subcategories. So I can pick like nursing and pain. Um, and it's just, again, a good way to get an idea of what might be a good place to submit. Well, I'll figure out why that link is broken and send you guys a follow-up on the actual link. Because we just Thanks. opened it like last week. I don't know why. I'm just doing that. Um, okay, this next one is Jane. Like. Tarzan and Jane. And it stands for the Journal Author Name Estimator. You can see there's like a guy, there's like a person swinging, like Tarzan behind there. Um, so you can do a couple different things here. You can actually copy paste your abstract into here to see, and it'll pick up some keywords. Or if you want to, like if I want to write about, um, uh, let's see, emergency, nursing, um, EKGs, and, and then I can find journals. And this is going to tell me which are might be some good fits for the words I've typed in. So, and it tells you, you know, it ranks them. So Journal of Emergency Nursing is highest, whereas like Euro Intervention, which I don't even know what that is, is lowest. Um, I was pretty specific about my words, but you can do, um, let me think of some Falls, 
the journal, journal of Nursing Care Quality, if I look up falls and quality improvement is the highest. Um, and then over here, it's actually showing you the influence, which is their impact factor. So you can see that really, let's see, this is 2.1, 7.9 is JAMA. So if even JAMA is really not that high. Yeah, I would have thought JAMA was higher, but okay. I wonder, let me see what's on I want to see if the Lancet was in there. It's not. Um, yeah, like so. Let's see. I wonder actually. You can see the current articles they've had. Let me. I'll look up the um, impact factors in a second. Um, so that's Jane. I think this one's pretty. I like this one because it's really simple. Like you're not having to like click a million things, sort things. You literally. We had an article I think that we have submitted five times, and it wasn't until the sixth time that it got accepted. So we were like running out of options. And I think I used this at one point to figure out what the heck to submit it to. And it was, um, we ended up submitting to a quality improvement journal. Um, so that's, that's the type of project it was. But this is really straightforward and helpful, I think. Does it show all journals or just peer-reviewed journals or does it say if there's a difference? I don't know. Here it says we were predatory journals down here and um, now tags journals that are currently indexed in Medline and other and open access journals approved by the Directory of Open Access Journals. So it should be things that are more reputable um, mm -hmm. versus things that are a little bit more suspect. If a, so, a note about impact factors. It takes about 10 years for a journal to be even able to apply for an impact factor. If a journal has an impact factor, it's a very good sign that it's a reputable journal, but just because it doesn't have one doesn't mean that it's not. It just means that it might not have been around long enough. So Elizabeth is, you know, part of the Holistic Nurse Association. They have a journal and they, they just now have started applying for their impact factor because you have to have data from previous years to show basically what your impact factor would even be. Um, so just that's another kind of thing to think about. And then finally, there's this um, site called, I never know how to say it, if it's Scamago, Scamago. And again, this one's like a little bit more complicated in terms of the functionality of it. Maybe. This is all journals too, it's not just nursing journals. Um, so you can go in by the journal rankings. They use this SJR and an H index. It's, a, it's another type of, it's like, it's not impact factor, but it's another um, way to quantify the reach of it. So they're ranking it by their own um, factor, basically. Uh, so here, these are all different types of journals, nature reviews, reviews of modern physics. So it's not just specific to healthcare, but you can come up here and you can pick subject areas. So I can pick nursing. I want to pick let's see, critical care nursing. And so this is going to give me all the critical care nursing journals. I wonder if transplant is in here. Oh, yeah. And then Maddie, what, <coughs> excuse me, while you're looking for that, Ashley was asking how can you find out a journal's acceptance rate? So is that by going on the actual journal's website and looking there? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not necessarily always available, but yeah, it will tend, it sometimes will be on their website. And I'm going to show you the next thing I'm actually going to show you is how to look at the journal website itself. Um, okay, so the first thing to do is to go to the journal website. Yeah, once you've figured out what journal you want to look into, then there's a slew of guidance on that journal's website, which and probably right. has their acceptance rate too. So this one, I picked um, Worldviews on Evidence-Based Nursing. That's uh, the journal that we're gonna look at now. It says here that the uh, impact factor is 2.5, which again, is kind of is relatively high for nursing. Um, the Lancet is 60, I just looked it up. But again, nursing are all a little bit lower. I think it's the Journal of Nursing Science. I believe is the highest. I, I can look it up. Um, so the their landing page usually is usually double. It's for people who want to read the journal itself, but then also people who want to submit. 
So when you go on, it's usually going to be like you can read the articles that are open access, things like that. Um, I can go to the latest issue. But what I want to do is look for information about how to actually submit an article. And unfortunately, it's they all look a little different depending on which journal's website you've gone to. Um, so I can click here, which is contribute, or over here is submit an article. But if I go to contribute, then it's going to give me some more information. And I want to go to my author guidelines. And this is going to basically tell me what they what their focus is, uh, their focus is who should submit, what types of projects they submit, or they will consider. Um, so down here, this is all the different things that they'll consider. And then if you, it's long, so we're not gonna, gonna be able to read the whole thing, but they're gonna basically tell you how to submit it. Here's the editor's information. Um, how, if you're gonna, how you're gonna upload it, if they want it all in one document. Many times, and most times really, when you're uploading information, you're uploading the manuscript and then you up upload all the other pieces separately. So you upload the, all the figures and the tables and different documents. So they talk about all that in here. And they tell you like what types of citations to use, all that stuff. So this yes. is really, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, speaking of the figures and tables um, piece, like. I, when I submitted my um, figure, like they're just, they're so particular about what they need to look like, like very clean. And the, the editor was just like, you don't need to include a figure or table. Like, she's like, just include it. You're fine. <laughs> so I was like, okay, phew. Cause I was, you know, I'm used to my flashy, make flashy smart art and they're just like a plain, plain yeah. table. But, um, yeah, and so, and also journals, this is sort of, this is a call, again, for call for papers. You can see over here, they're doing a special themed issue on implementation science. And then this one's for implementing and sustaining EVP. So sometimes it's a good idea to keep an eye out to see if maybe one of your projects fits really well into something they're specifically looking for. So um, you always wanna bookmark this so you can keep, really keep track of what they're asking for. Again, you'd be surprised how many times people don't follow that. Um, and then when you actually want to submit, I'm not, we're not going to get too far into it, but again, it's just like we were talking about with the online submission systems for conferences. They, it's an online submission system for journals, like 99% of the time. Um, so you log in and then you're able to see, it starts to sort of walk you through the process of what you have to upload, what information needs to be there. Um, most of the systems are rather rudimentary, like they're, they look almost like they're like a beta version of the website itself. Um, but I also, as a heads up, it can take, even though it's not difficult, it can take a very long time because it's so nitpicky, tiny little details of all these things that you're gonna need to upload, all these attestations you need to do. Um, so if you're gonna get ready to submit something, set aside a couple hours because you don't wanna mess up your submission in this, once you've done all the work of creating it, just in like the clicking through the buttons, um, I wonder actually if this will let me sign in and show you mine. And this is the same too, like, like we were talking about poster submission, all of the other authors on the poster, it's the same thing with the manuscript too, the other authors, like you, you could be the corresponding author, but the other ones will still need to go in and agree and sign off and create an account. So um, something to keep in mind. Um, it's, it won't let me sign in. I was actually, I wanted to show you Journal of Emergency Nursing because that's where I have the most, um, and I've worked for the system the most, but I just, it's, it's been, it was down when I tried to open it, which is kind of weird. Looks like they have an interruption here too. Um, so yeah, again, you're just, you're doing everything online. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds to like overwhelm you guys, um, but just to mention a couple things real quick. There's something called open access. You might be asked, at some point if you want your article to be open access and that just means that you're paying a fee. So you pay for basically other people to have access instead of people paying for access to the journal. Um, it, it's usually between like $1,000 and $2,000. Sometimes people will have, like write it into a grant or something like that if their um, project is grant funded or if their organization will pay for it. I've never done it, but um, you could actually see when, you, when we got to the journal webpage in the beginning. Um, 
it says open access. And these are the people that paid for you to be able to see their article so that you don't have to have a subscription to this uh, journal to read it. Um, and then the other only thing I wanted to mention, and this does apply to abstracts too, for the most part, the reviewers are going to be your peers, and they're also going to not know who you are. So the idea is for it to be fair so that um, you're, someone doesn't recognize your name and play favorites or recognize the organization and say, oh, you know, Johns Hopkins is always really great quality. We should definitely include them. They want it to be as fair as possible and really just evaluate the work in and of itself. And so you need to exclude any identifying information. So all of the author's names tend to go on a separate title page. Um, and then as you're writing, you, would, you wouldn't say something like, this project was completed at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. You would say something like, this project was completed at a level one trauma center in an urban academic setting. So you tend to be kind of vague. Um, all these details are things that we've learned just from like having to do it a whole bunch of times. Um, but if you get to the point where you're writing and you want to have us like help you walk through this, we can set up a time and go over all these details. So you don't have to remember all this or anything. I don't want you guys to like blaze over. Um, but please know that there's all these little like nitpicky things, but we can definitely help you walk through it. Um, so yeah, so you have the rules. You want to follow the, ci the citations for the journal. I don't understand. In nursing school, it was all about APA. I don't know if you guys that happened with you and now I've actually it's actually very rare that I have a journal who wants true APA so I don't know like what all that business is about but just so you know it's not by default APA yeah same and I like I didn't know how to set up the footnotes and all the citations with AMA it's so different and there are stickers about it so um, citation manager is helpful even the owl like website, you know, for reference checker that helps. Um, and then you, of course, want to review the format rules, not only for the citations, like at the ends, but do they want um, you to include the person's name? Do they want you to include a number for your in-text citations? Um, and then like Holly said, always have someone second, do a second check. Um, you kind of have to by default with Hopkins because you have to have your um, director sign off. But obviously, if you're putting someone's name on something as an author, they need to agree with it. Um, sometimes people like to include people to like be nice or to like be generous or charitable or something. And that's sometimes called um, uh, guest authorship. Keep in mind that anything, and if someone offers it to you, anything that someone's name is on, if something comes back later and it was, turns out it was done incorrectly or unethically, like your name is on that or that person's name is on that. Um, so it really, even though someone might not be super involved and they're an author, they really need to say, this is okay, I wanna assign my name to it. So keep that in mind as well. Um, all right, so, we, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, using templates, um, which again, are my favorite, maybe not necessarily mm -hmm. everybody's. Um, and then some templates and some guidelines really that so we want to make you aware of that, or that should make your work a lot easier. And so you're aware of sort of what the expectations are around um, different types of writing. Yeah, there, any kind of template and guideline are super, super helpful, especially if you're working with a team. It helps you kind of break down like the method section versus intervention section, everything. It helps you chunk out your project. And even using like a, I can't ever say this word, Gantt, Gantt, Gantt yeah. art for like how you want to keep track of what writing you want to have accomplished by a certain time. Cause it does, it does take time, especially you're, you know, you're working whatever other commitments you have in your life. So there's, it's definitely helpful to break out, out time in your calendar to be able to work, work on this work and get yourself in the work mode for writing. But there are different templates available. Um, generally the, like author guidelines page on the journal article will have information like this for you to help break it down. Um, and they're mostly, yeah, there we go. And this is our website that we have these. So depending on what project you're doing, I like to use the Squires template because I, I like quality improvement. That's what I'm most comfortable writing about. But it breaks out um, your whole project into like manageable pieces. So it's not just a huge manuscript you have to write. Now it's like, okay, I have to write um, what what the background is. Usually that's like your literature review. Why is this the problem? What are the best practices from the literature to improve your problem? 
and then writing about it. And really, same with the abstract, like writing the introduction and the conclusion, like maybe write those last. I don't know, Maddie, if you have experience with that, but like the introduction and the conclusion really go along together. So it's kind of good to do that. Do you? Yeah. Um, I, I'll usually write, I actually think I usually write sequentially, like I'll usually write, I do usually write the introduction first because if it's to the point where I've done a whole project, I probably know why I did it. Like I should know why I did it to be able to yeah. <laughs> articulate that pretty well. Um, but this really, people struggle a lot with this part because it's, and, and tend to write a lot of information, but really you want, it shouldn't be more than like three, three paragraphs. And so this walks you through what you need to include and exactly what, how it should be included. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, we have it here in a Word document um, available for you through our website, the intranet. But this is actually based on um, the Squire guideline 2.0 and it's, uh, or a group of people got together and basically said, these are the things that are important if you're gonna be reporting on a quality improvement project, not only to report on, but to have included to begin with because you wanna make sure the process is being followed. Um, and I can pull, I can show that website as well. Uh, but that's where this is coming from. Yeah, it's so helpful. And then really like that first draft, it might take you, you know, two months to even get it all out, but just having it, I, I heard somewhere just like the ugly baby. So just get all your thoughts down on one paper, present this to the world, knowing like, this is just my ugly version not the final version. I'm open to any kind of feedback and editing, but just to get all of your thoughts down at first is really helpful to do. Yeah, and I love, you could just type right into this for this um, Squire guideline. Yeah, and this is, this is where it came from. We basically just took this and made it a writable document. And if yeah. you want to like look at this later, it tells you, it tell, they tell you why, they tell you why they did it. They have their explanation and elaboration, all that type of stuff. Um, and I've actually submitted and had to um, print off the checklist for this and uh, submit it with my paper saying which lines each element was addressed on. Mm. Right here. Oh, yes. Yeah, speaking of lines, that's something that I never, I did. Because once you, when you're submitting your manuscript, you actually have to set up in Microsoft Word, like every single line of the document has a number associated with it. So the editor can quickly go, okay, on line 241, this word should be that, like so particular with the editing. And I don't, the author was so, I mean, the editor, she was so great and just like it for me and submitted it. She was just like, here, you're supposed to do it like this. Let me change it for you. Here you go. Which like was great, but then it didn't help me learn how to do it. So I'm still going to be like, Maddie, how do I do this? If I ever need to do it again. But it's cool. Okay, well, EPQA, Maddie, can you talk about these now? These are more like for the evidence-based um, inquiry projects publication. Yeah, so, so, so to back up a little bit, um, so we're showing you templates that are project specific. So depending on what type of project you're doing, there is probably a guideline to tell you how you're supposed to do it. Some of them are suggestions and some of them are rules. Like for quality improvement, they almost are always gonna want you to do the um, SPIRE guidelines. This is a suggestion. Um, as far as I know, and no one's contradicted me, so I'm thinking it's true, there are no universally agreed upon and accepted guidelines or um, rubrics for presenting an evidence-based practice project. So what we did, there was a group that did a study or a survey to determine what the most important elements of an evidence-based practice project are in order to evaluate the quality of it. So we took all those elements and actually put it into a guideline so that it's telling you what you need to include when you write it up. This, I, and I've seen this a lot, people struggle a little bit to figure out under the normal sort of traditional scientific paper headers like introduction, um, methods, results, conclusion, they struggle a little bit of which parts of the EDP process go under which header because it's a little bit of a square peg round hole situation. So this tells you exactly where to put it. And I've honestly seen different journals have it written different ways. So we're actually working on making this a more formal um, guideline, but that's like in the future. But for now, um, we took that guideline, we put it into this, there's a PDF version as well as a Word version. It's posted on the intranet. 
Um, and again, it's just like the Squire guideline. It goes through and it tells you exactly what to write in each section to make sure that you're providing all the information that you need for someone to evaluate your project, both of the quality of it, as well as have faith in the results that you're reporting. Um, the other really nice thing about this is the thing I see the most, one of the things I see the most when people are doing a group writing is overlap between the sections, especially more novice writers have a really hard time keeping straight um, what's, what's results, what's methods, what's discussion. So this, it, as much as it can, make sure that people are sort of, you know, staying in their lane and only writing what they need to write. And that's mostly because we don't want people to do more work than they have to do. Like, I, I hate to have someone obviously spend a ton of time writing two paragraphs for a paper, and then it turns out that that part was actually for, that would actually go in a different section that they weren't assigned and someone already wrote that. So this is really sort of to help kind of keep you focused on what information you need to include. Um, and so what we'll do is, you know, assign a section to each person and then, um, fill it in like in each box and then the someone at everyone will turn in their sections and then you basically take out all of the text that's actual like the part of the paper and copy paste it into what would look like a more traditional paper um and we um holly and i actually met last week we are going to have um a, a dissemination workshop 2.0 where we we're going to get more into sort of like the nitty gritties of like what a discussion is what a me what methods are all that stuff but just just so you know there um, we'll have more information about that but this does exist to help sort of guide what should be written up in an EVP. Maybe I'll learn how to number the word lines by then. <laughs> I will. Um, and then the final thing is the equator network. And this is actually a, a repository of different reporting guidelines. So it's more so for research. Squire is in here. It's actually, um, where is it? Here, quality yeah. improvement studies. Um, so it's, it's here. But this is a group who has come together to help um, sort of compile all of the different guidelines that have been researched and established for different types of projects. So depending on what type of project you're doing, it's going to tell you what information you need to include. There's actually, see this, see all 436 reporting guidelines. So there's a lot of them. And there's actually a way on here to search for one. Oh, I saw bottom left was a search bar. Yeah, there's a way to search um, like for which one you're supposed to use. Oh, search for reporting guidelines. I see it. Yeah, so, he, so here you go study type. So let's say I did a mixed method study in see, health informatics. Oops. Oh. I think I was too specific. Start again. So here, um, so for mixed methods, here are the reporting guidelines for mixed methods paper. And you can even get into like, is it a retrospective study? Is it a prospective study? Again, this is something that I think is helpful because it gives you really clear directions, but some people feel like it boxes them in. Um, so if you're a type of person who likes to have very clear, do this, then this, then this, this is this, is your friend. So I talked briefly about like the peer reviewed versus non peer reviewed. There are different types of journals you could submit to, but then there are also other ways you can share your work that like might be a good stepping stone to get to the manuscript publication, such as blogs, um, letters to the editor, which is kind of what Maddie talked about before opinion pieces, a podcast, um, a magazine like the, um, what's the ANA, like the ANA magazine, they always have magazines with like a, a nice just story of a project or even educational content, resilience during COVID, uh, making YouTube video, having interviews done. And these are all like also putting in a plug for um, CNI content for arts. There are a lot of ways that you could do this stuff even just within GHH to disseminate your work, um, producing CNI content. And that is something now on the arts palette if you guys are arts participants. Um, 
And Ashley's doing an interview. So Ashley will have practice with that. Mm-hmm. For Scholars Day. Yeah, Scholars Day. So we showed you some of the poster templates and um, I believe this links to our Nursing Scholars Day poster template page. And then there's also at GHM, there's Microsoft Office templates in general, whether it's a PowerPoint or um, other, like any other way that you would use the Johns Hopkins brand. You can click here and then Maddie showed me the great trick to get in there. Yeah, there we go. There's even like stock photos here. They love oh, yeah, Zoom virtual backgrounds. That's cool. Yeah, so don't log in. Hit click here at the top. That's what I, I couldn't figure out how to get into. But there's like a huge marketing and branding policy and rules and guidelines for that. So it's helpful to know this is already something created by our marketing department. Yeah, so lots of different ones. And on the left, you can scroll down specifically to JH Nursing to get the logo. You see at the top, it says Johns Hopkins Medicine. I like to get the ones that say Johns Hopkins Nursing on there. Oh yeah, and I went, let me go back. Oh, here, office templates. Oh yeah, there it is, cool. Oh yeah, and that says it's the Johns Hopkins Hospital. So just depending Can on- start there again? Like, where was the link to JHM? You looked on that, you said? I'm sorry, Raven, what'd you say? How did you get to that website where you said click here again? Oh, that's just the, um, to get access, it's like all on the intranet site. So to get access to it, it, so it knows that you're like a JHH employee, it'll single sign on by doing the click here. But we have it, it linked here, but it's all, it, yeah, what it, brand.hopkinsmedicine.org was the link. And then you can get into all all the branding that they have. And then, um, right, and then there was also the, I kind of closed it, but there's the, this is the Nursing Scholars Day, so um, Raven, this will be, and I think you just got this in the email this morning. Um, actually, are you, did you do a poster for Scholars Day this year? Yeah, two, two years ago. Well, I was, I was a co for Ravens. Oh, cool, year. okay, so you're both doing it. Um, so I mean, you might already know this exists, but this is again the intranet page under Nursing Scholars Program. And if you go to poster resources, this is where there's the EVP, QI, and research templates, as well as um, there's a link, there's a podcast that we did last year related to Nursing Scholars posters. And if you skip to minute 230, it talks a little bit about sort of what you might, what might be helpful for you to know for this specific poster. Um, so, um, so Holly, do you want to talk about next steps? Yeah, so this is um, normally the time where we would either break out, talk as a group, give you support on your project work that you're doing. So um, I don't know how you want to use this time, whether it's like if we're all staying together working on maybe your poster or anything you have going on or a breakout session, which I think it might be helpful to all stay together. Or um, I don't know, Maddie, keep, keep going. Yeah, so basically, do you guys want some time to look now? I think it sounds like, unless you have something else, it sounds like the most, um, the most pending um, thing is going to be the Nursing Scholars Day poster. Do you want some time to look at that now or do you would you rather do that at a different time? Like you, this can basically be some work time for you if you would like it. I'm okay with doing it now. Okay. So um, Raven, do you maybe want to draw, I don't know if like if you're on your tablet or if you're on a computer computer, but if you want to drive, we can show we can have you pull up the template and start looking at what might go in it. Does that sound? Okay. So let me stop sharing. Do you want to pause recording to you for this? Uh, sure. You can also make sure it's the right size to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to pause the recording for everyone watching later. We'll be back soon. 
Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we were able to talk about Raven's presentation, poster presentation, and I think we um, came up with some really good ideas. So I'm glad that we took some time to do that. And now we're going yeah. to just talk about a couple um, little tips and tricks briefly, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Um, this might be repetitive. Do you guys have something you already know? Do you guys know about and or use Google Scholar? I know I've heard it before. Scholar. Yeah, probably from one of your other workshops, but I haven't used it. Okay. So this is my like, I feel like I should be getting like payment from Google Scholar. <laughs> Not that they need my help at all, but um, I talk about it all the time. So just I want to show you a couple really helpful things with Google Scholar. Um, and to get to it, I literally just Google Google Scholar. And this is usually how I get to it, but now I've bookmarked it. Okay, so let me show you some really helpful things it does. Um, the first thing is that you should never be doing a citation by hand ever again. Um, you have a citation, you have citation managers, and you also, if you just have like a one-off um, where you need a citation, I always come to Google Scholar. And so if I type in um, HIV test, okay. Um, all these articles come up and then there's this little um, cite button here. It looks like half of a quotation. If you click on it, it gives you MLA, APA, Chicago, Harvard, and Vancouver references. And then you just click on it, it automatically picks the entire thing and you can copy paste it. You can also um, export from here to um, citation managers like EndNote and so that's super helpful for a lot of people. It's super helpful for me. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is some of the other stuff along the bottom here. So this cited by function is, can be really helpful for a couple things. It can sometimes tell you, um, like for example, Holly had this article recently that was really old. It was from like 1990s. And we were like, huh, well maybe this is a seminal article. Like maybe this is really like a groundbreaking article that's been cited, you know, a thousand times. It's considered sort of like a establishing the state of the science type article. So we put it into Google Scholar and we realized it had only been cited by like 25 people. So we realized it was just old and it wasn't like old and special. Um, so that's helpful for that. But the other way it can be really helpful is if you find an article that is really relevant to what you're doing, but it's older, you can see people who have cited it because of course it has something has to have been published after to have it be cited. Um, and so it can give you something like some more recent information about a very similar topic. It's also helpful if you're using a tool. Um, so if there was a tool, let's say to, um, there's one that I was talking to someone about recently. It's a palliative care assessment for nurses to, to get an assessment of their knowledge, and it's a little bit older. So we wanted to see who has used the tool and where, where it might be validated. And so we did the cited by, and we could see everyone who had cited that tool to get an idea of what had been happening more recently with that specific tool. So that's helpful. And then this related articles um, is just what it sounds like, where it's gonna tell you, it's gonna take you th to things that are similar. When you do go to the cited by or the related, you can, um, continue using the search function if you click search within citing articles and you can type up here the things you're looking for and so it'll look within this smaller list versus all of Google Scholar. Um, there is now a way to generate citations in PubMed. PubMed updated recently. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It looks a little different. Um, so the librarians do point out that you can do it like that but I still do it like this. You can do it however you want. Um, and then the other thing I like about Google Scholar is just one thing you're aware of, so you're aware advanced search is over here. It's kind of hidden, I think. So if you want to, you know, put in the dates, the author, things like that, that's all available here. And then um, the other thing you can do, we're not going to get too deep into this, but you can create your own profile. And so then you can see every time and you have, if you've written an article, if it gets cited, if it actually, you know, it's accepted, but it hasn't gotten published yet, like I get an email saying, hey, your article's out. Um, and so I can go in here and I can see basically all the articles I've written and um, they're, they're sorted by when, how often they've been cited. So they kind of go down. And honestly, this is sometimes how I know if something's come out after it's been accepted because it can take a few months. And so you don't necessarily know unless you're checking 
And so sometimes Google will be like, hey, you, you published something, congratulations. So I have a Google alert on myself, basically. Um, any questions about Google Scholar? Um, just confirming, like when you were setting up the search grid and everything, it looks very similar to PubMed and all that, but we're not to use Google Scholar for an EDP project, right? Because it can't be recreated, right? Yeah, it's a super helpful tool to use in addition to using a formal search tool like CINAHL or PubMed, but it shouldn't be in place of. So I have it open a lot to help find articles to help sort of like navigate things, but the actual search has to take place in a um, database like PubMed or CINAHL for various reasons. And mostly that it's this Google search is pow powered a lot by what powers a traditional Google search. So if you're like looking for a restaurant, um, it's gonna do a whole bunch of analytics about which restaurants been clicked on the most and it's gonna show them in different orders depending on the day, mm -hmm. depending on what's happening and it does the same thing. For articles. It doesn't necessarily show them all in the same order um, or even show them at all, depending on what's happening in the magical Google background. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so then another thing I wanted to point out is ORCID. And this is, um, you might see something when you're filling out a, both for publications, but also for filling out poster applications. It might ask you for your ORCID ID. And this is what they're talking about. Um, it's a tool basically so that you, you register yourself and then you put, you get a, um, it's like a 12, I don't remember how many digits. It's a long number that you can use as your ORCID ID. And so this helps you track all the things that you're involved in. So if I, um, let's see if I can log in. I have my password written down. I don't know why it's not working. Okay. Well, it's not working. I don't know why. Um, but if I were to log in, I could look up my own name. I could see things that were associated with my name. It's also helpful if, like, I go by um, Maddie most of the time, but my, my full name is Madeline. And on a paper, I'll um, usually put my name as Madeline. So I can tell Orchid, um, you know, just in case if Maddie gets, comes up, it'll also associate Maddie Whalen with Madeline. Um, especially also like people who have really common names like Ashley is probably Ashley Thomas is probably a relatively common name and so you can tell it which Ashley Thomas you are um, and so it'll know which things to associate with your name um, and then finally there's Scopus which does a similar thing to ORCID in that it can help you um, it associates things with your name. Oops, just um, so you can look at an author profile. And this is what I was actually, so I, look, I can put my last name, first name. So here, so it has me associated with Johns Hopkins School of Medicine as well as the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, but these are both me. So I can see things that are, it has 10 documents associated with my name. Um, and you can do this for other people too. So if you want to see some things that other people have written, if I want to, um, like, let's say I'm going to talk, I'm going to give Holly a little introduction and I want to see things that she's done. Let's see what. Holly, do you have anything published on your maiden name? Sorry, no. Mm -mm. Um, so that's a good, that's another good example is if you change your last name. Um, so it looks like you have, it only has two things in here. Um, so and the most I'm recent proud of those two program. things. Hmm? And I'm very proud of those two things. I didn't know if there was more, i sorry, I meant, I thought that there would be more, there was other things that it wasn't picking up. No, I have, to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. It's my name and I'm proud of them. Uh, no, you definitely should be proud of them. I didn't know if there was other things too that it just, because like, 
it only had 10 for mine. And I think, so I think there's other things it's not. Mm. Um, One so, day, I'm going for 10. Um, so those are just like little tools. They're not, you don't necessarily need them, but um, I wanted to make sure we talked about ORCID because you're gonna see that. And just so you know, that's what it's referring to. Um, and then finally, these are just some lists of your um, representatives throughout the departments for people who are resources. Obviously, there's um, us in the Center for Nursing Inquiry. Um, you guys, I mean, I feel like you're almost like resources in and of yourselves. Um, so maybe we should put you on this list. Um, but these, but technically, these are the people who are, they're the former research um, committee members who were like officially designated as the, um, the people, the representatives from your department. For the department of for the research program and then uh, this again is not necessarily something you need right now but just so you know we do have a list of approved nurse PIs for research studies this is a list of who they are it actually needs to be updated um, but the takeaway message from this is if you are interested in doing a research study reach out to us and we'll tell you who is approved as a nurse principal in Um, is there anything that you, we didn't talk about that you guys want to ask? Any questions, concerns? The only thing was about the um, getting alerts for articles, you know, new publications mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, that doesn't have to be during the recording part, but whatever. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have looked that up during the break. Um, I wrote that down too as a a list because I I think that would be beneficial for a lot of people to know how to do. Here, I actually just pulled it up. I think, yeah, I think Holly, let's make a little video on it and we can post it on the internet to show people how to do it so we're not like having to, I'm not having to try and remember how I did it because I do have. Yeah. Um, if you just type yeah, in my we'll NCBI, yeah, you can log in and then see here it has my um, my PubMed searches. These are the people, these are the journals I get updates on. So okay, we'll, yeah, we'll maybe we'll, we'll maybe um, we'll record you helping me set mine up and then. Oh, perfect. Yes. Okay. Well, that'll um, be helpful. Yeah. And then finally, um, I mean, I think that you guys know how to get in touch with us, but just in case you forget or anyone else needs to remember, um, we do have our nursing inquiry email address as well as the closed Facebook group. This is where we're gonna have a lot of the fun stuff for Nursing Scholars Day as well. So if you're not already part of the group, make sure you sign up. Um, we do have Twitter and Instagram, which are a little less active, but they do exist. And then we of course have the nursing intranet. We have a newsletter if in the bottom of all of our email signatures, there's a way to opt into that. And then we have our podcast as well as the videos and visuals. Um, we also are, have our, we have office hours every month. Um, and then we can also, we're available just to set up an appointment whenever you um, need help. So just or an email know. consult if you have any questions creating your post or Raven. Yes, for sure. It's also so easy now to hop on a Zoom. Um, okay. So just to show everyone real quick too, this is, this is our intranet site. And so all of um, that, the NCBI video we were just talking about is gonna go here under visuals. Um, so you can see what we're doing. And then um, our workshops are all here under workshop and that's where this will be posted as well as the upcoming workshops. I did wanna mention that um, Holly and I spent some time recently um, recording three workshops um, that are just recordings or we don't have any participants um, but they're about how, tips and tricks for using Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, those should be going up any day now. Laura Motel is working on getting them posted. And so those are like that format painter thing we talked about, changing the background. Some stuff I'm sure are things that you already know, but some are things that um, might be helpful. So those are gonna go up. They're um, very casual. It's just Holly and I kind of going through some stuff, but they might be helpful to look at uh, to see a couple more things that you may didn't, maybe didn't know about Microsoft. Um, all right. Do you guys have any other questions? All right. I'm going to stop our recording. So thank you for anyone who joined us on our recording. Um, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you.